From Gimlet Media, this is The Nod. I'm Eric Eddings. Today I'm going to tell you a story about a plantation. It was called Cooley Me, and on it there used to be two homes. One was the big house. It was a house the plantation was known for. This massive, white, three-story home, shaped kind of like a cross. The Harstons lived there. They were the masters of the plantation, known for their immense wealth. And just a short walk from the big house was a very different home. It was a log cabin. No running water, no bathroom. It housed up to 11 people, a family, the Hairstons. They tended the plantation's crops, mostly corn and cotton. They also worked in the big house, cooking the Harstons' meals and cleaning for them. A black family serving a rich white family on a plantation is a familiar story. But this isn't that, because these two families, they shared this relationship with one serving the other way past the end of slavery. Through Reconstruction, through both world wars, through Brown versus Board, Martin Luther King's rise and assassination, all the way to the 1970s. Today on The Nod, we tell the story of these two families that for 100 years after the Civil War seemed trapped in amber and about one woman who broke out of that amber and then shattered it for everyone else. When I was born, I lived in what was the log cabin. In 1942, Everly Hairston was born on the Cooley Mee Plantation. It was the very same plantation where her ancestors had been enslaved. That cabin that Everly grew up in had likely been on the property since the days of Reconstruction. In that big room was my mom and dad was in one bed with one of the, the babies. And then in the other bed was um, probably uh, three of us sleeping. And then one child always stayed in the bedroom with my grandparents if you went on the other side of the house. So why was Everly living on the Cooley Mee Plantation decades after the end of slavery? Well, before I can answer that, we've got to go back, way back, back in the time. The Hairstons were a family who immigrated from Scotland to the American South, and they made their names running a huge network of plantations. The family was said to have owned some 42 plantations in Virginia, North Carolina, and Mississippi, and they enslaved some 10,000 people. Their wealth and their slave holdings earned them the title the Rockefellers of the South. This all changed with the Civil War. The enslaved were now free, and with their freedom, Black people all over the South got the opportunity to choose a surname, Many chose the names of their former masters, and that's how the Black Harrisons, Everly's ancestors, came to share a last name with the white family that once owned them. They would call us Harrisons when I was living on the plantation, and they, their name was Hoston. <laughs> I just thought that was so interesting. <laughs> <laughs> preferred that designation, like that they were Harstons and they were you were Harston. And they called us, and we were Harstons. But the end of the Civil War in no way meant the end of plantation life. Black people at the time had no money and nowhere to go. So most of them stayed put and worked as sharecroppers. And then in 1915, the first wave of the Great Migration started. Millions of Black people moved into cities and to the North to start again. This is a story we've all heard before, the one in our textbooks about Black people finding a better life. But the one we don't often hear is the story of those who didn't migrate, the story of those who stayed. And that's the story of Everly's family. During our childhood in the 50s, Everly's life on the plantation still had many traces of life before the Civil War. Everly's family still worked for the same family, the Harstons, who'd passed the plantation down through generations. When Everly was a kid, the guy in charge was Judge Peter Harston. In addition to running the plantation, he was an actual judge. Everly's grandfather was a butler and valet for Judge Peter's family. Or as Everly put it, He was what they call the house nigger. You know, he did all the work in the house. He made the biscuits because that's something they would serve every morning. He always tended to the garden He would, or the flowers. He took fresh flowers in every day uh, and ra- arranged them. Um, if um, the plantation owner went out and, and grocery shopped, he would meet her at the car 
and uh, bring in all the groceries, that kind of thing. Her dad was a sharecropper of the plantation. He would plant crops, mostly cotton and corn. And Everly and her siblings would have to help. Work on the plantation came first, especially during the harvest season. I hated it. I, I was so, I hated it with a passion. We would have to stay out of school, Many, my older brother, older sister and I. We would have to stay out of school usually two consecutive weeks at a time to pick cotton. And um, I'd get behind in school. I hated that. I hated that. She hated missing school for weeks on end when no one else in her class did. She told me that she hated the fact that the cotton they picked, when it was finally sold, the Harstons would take 70 cents of every dollar, and her family would only get 30. Everly's family's cut was barely enough to live on. And on top of that, one of her sisters had a chronic liver condition, and her care was expensive. Everyone had to do a second and sometimes third job around town. Everly would take Fridays off from school to help her mom clean the homes of white families. They were paid less than minimum wage, and they were treated how Black people everywhere were treated, terribly. One Friday, Everly hit a breaking point. She was tasked with ironing what felt like an impossibly high stack of clothes. I'm ironing, and I'm ironing. The owner of the house, she came in to me and just filled up the basket even more and said to me, when it's time for you to eat, you can go out in the garage. Well, that got to me. You can go out in the garage, and I'm thinking... I'm here, we're going to clean your kitchen, clean your dishes, my hands are going to be on those, and you want me to go in the garage to eat? I was so angry. I was so angry. So I'm now in the room where I'm ironing, and I'm ironing, and the more I ironed, it seemed like the more was in the basket. So I said, I'll fix her. So I just sat the iron down on a blouse and scorched it. Scorched it. The blouse was burnt to a crisp. And so, <laughs> and so I took that and put it in the bottom of the basket. <laughs> oh, God, I did. I really did. Racism was everywhere. And for a lot of Black people, the only thing you could do was internalize it and let out your frustration and anger in these small, private acts. For me, this story helps explain why Everly's family might have stayed on the plantation. Against the incredibly low bar for white people at the time, the Harsons didn't seem so bad. I think my grandfather felt like they were contributing to us. So why ask for more? Plus, Cooley Me was the economic engine for the entire county, which made its owner, Judge Peter, a powerful man. No matter the conditions, Everly's grandfather thought that they were lucky for the jobs and housing the Harsons had given them. I mean, what other white people were doing that? My grandfather was always praising them. And my grandmother, if I may be so blunt, she would say, oh, you need to stop it. They ain't shit. (laughs) (laughs) And it wasn't just her grandmother who didn't feel like the Harstons should be up on some pedestal. Sometimes aunts and uncles who'd left the plantation would come back to visit. And on these get-togethers, they'd sit and rehash the same point. They would say... Um, things like, well, they're not really doing anything for you. You know, you you are sacrificing your whole life for them. And my grand- grandfather would say, boy, you don't understand. Often an argument would break out. But there's a segment of the family that wouldn't talk about their treatment at all. Everly's parents. I do believe that my father didn't like it, but he held it in. He didn't talk about it. And so you learn to just not say anything, to pretend that it's not happening. It's not, it's not good. I mean, do you think that's just a survival instinct? Sure. At that point? it was their way of surviving. Even Everly's feelings about the White Harstons were complicated. After all, the families were close. Every Christmas, we would go over to the plantation house when, when I was growing up. And we would sing Christmas carols together. And it was like a family affair. She told Brittany and me that she also liked the time she spent with the judge. Occasionally, I would miss the bus on purpose. So Mr. Peter would drive me to school. He was a judge in Moxville. And so I could ride to school with him. And what did you two talk about when, when on the you drive? Know, he asked me, how was I doing? Just talking to me, he showed me that he was interested in me and who I was and what I was about. 
Was that different than the way that most adults talk to you when you were that yes. age? Yes. Most adults, gal, sit down. What you doing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, get on out there and, and get that water down. Yes, sure, it was very different. So Everly could understand where her grandfather was coming from, but she didn't agree with his conclusion that they shouldn't ask for more. She remembers the day where she realized she wanted more for herself. It was the fall harvest during Everly's senior year in high school. Everly was making her way through a massive cotton row, dragging her sack behind her. I was in the field with my brother and my sister, and they were always saying, come on, you know, come on, catch up. And while they'd done this dozens of times before, Everly was still scared of the things she knew were lurking in the fields. I was always afraid of the bugs, always looking around to see if there was a snake. So while she's picking cotton, she's scanning the ground, terrified of what she might find. I'm shaking my toe uh, uh, toe sack, and, and so I thought, okay, I got to do this. You know, I just got to do this so we can go back to school tomorrow. So I just kept on going. Well, 10 or 15 yards down that cotton row, I saw a brown snake. So I yelled to my brother, it's a copperhead! Most of the snakes that lived on the plantation were harmless, but copperheads are venomous and nothing to play with. My brother came back to investigate, and he saw it, but everywhere we would look around then, there was another snake. Wow. So all of us then took our toe sacks off, dr- uh, drugged them with us, and we ran as fast as we could until we reached the trailer that was parked at the beginning of the cotton row and climbed onto, I did, I climbed onto a bag on the very top, just trembling and shaking and praying and saying, oh my God, please, there must be a better way of life for me. Before this moment, Everly could only see two possible options for her future if she stayed at Cooley Me. Option one, staying at the plantation, picking cotton, living with her family, making just enough money to survive. Option two, working in town, cooking, cleaning, ironing, eating in a garage so as not to disturb the white family she was serving. Sitting on that bag of cotton, she realized she needed to invent another future. She needed to do something her parents, grandparents, and ancestors hadn't. That day, she made a promise to herself. She was going to leave. All I wanted to do at that point was just get away and I knew that so many people that I knew older than me um, had just stayed on plantations or stayed in the area, and that was their way of life. And that's not what I wanted for me. I knew that there had to be a better way of life for me. This episode of The Nod is brought to you by Burrow. Burrow makes luxury couches for real life. And recently, Burrow sent me a couch. It came in four boxes, and I gotta say, it was pretty easy to assemble. I know. I mean, I have one. I, ha- I do. <laughs> I have a, Yeah, I had one first. <laughs> okay. Um, it's competition. With you, it always is. Burrow couches are modular, meaning you can customize the size of your couch to fit your lifestyle. And you can also customize things like color and armrests. Wait, so what does your couch look like? Like, what did you get? So I got three-seater. And then I wanted something kind of bright, so I got the gray, the Uh light gray. So basically what you're telling me is that you picked out a couch that is exactly like the one that I have. We have mostly the same couch, but you got the low arms, and I got the high arms. And I didn't consider... Now, mind you, the couch looks great, but I came over to your, your apartment recently. Yeah, my domicile. And I happened to, like, lay my head down on the low arm side. And I realized... Damn, I wanted the low arms. Even when it comes to customizing a couch, I literally always win. You know what? Never mind. I love the high arms. Hurry and get your own unique burrow couch today. And to get $50 off your order, use promo code the nod at burrow.com. That's B-U-R-R-O-W.com. Offer code the nod. Getting out of Cooley Me was tough. It required money and a plan. Everly didn't even know where to start. But one day, during her senior year of high school, she saw something that could be her ticket out. 
I found a, uh, an article in the Winston-Salem paper asking for live-in maids in um, Hempstead, Long Island. So I answered the ad. It seemed like it was written just for her. Everly could work in New York, far from the reaches of Cooley Me, and save the money she needed in no time. And like that, just two weeks after graduating from high school, Everly was preparing to leave the place she'd call home. Now here I am, all packed up, got my ticket, ready to go to Winston-Salem to get the bus to go to New York. And I'm going by myself. My dad drove me. But one thing, dad didn't say anything. But I knew that he supported me because he didn't object to taking me. See? That was his way of showing me that he, he was pleased with what I was doing at 17, leaving the plantation. But her grandparents hadn't come around. My grandmother said to me, Gail, somebody's going to hit you in your head and you'll be back here. Inside, I was thinking, you'll see. You will see. Everly boarded her Greyhound bus. She was leaving behind the quiet country roads, acres of open land, and the slow pace of Southern life. She took the 16-hour trip to the loud, crowded, and rushed tempo of New York City. When she got off the bus, Everly dragged her luggage directly to the employment agency's headquarters on 42nd Street in Manhattan. In 1959, Everly was making a move that many Black people before her had made. She was leaving behind the South and all its history for opportunities in the North. And the opportunity that Everly wanted to pursue was becoming a nurse. She could help her sister, whose chronic illness had now become terminal. Her plan was to work as a maid, to make enough money to go to nursing school. The $35 a week that Everly could make as a maid in New York was a huge upgrade over what she could make in North Carolina. Walking into the massive room, a receptionist asked her to take a seat next to dozens of other Black women. Men started pouring into the room. They'd walk down the line of women and then tell the receptionist which woman they'd like to interview. It was interesting because the, the people that were there, mostly men, Jewish men, they were looking and interviewing girls who were red bones, if you will, first. I thought, you know what? Prejudice is everywhere. Red bone is a nickname for light-skinned black women. You know, those kinds of things just were you know, shocks. It's like shocking. So here I am now, and the dark-skinned girls were being left behind, and they were choosing all of us who were red bones. And so this guy chose me. He lived in Brooklyn. And he said to me, well, the agent said to me, what we do is you'll go with the um, uh, person who interviewed you. They'll take you to, he'll take you to his home, meet his wife and the children, and they'll let you know what your responsibilities are. And then from there, you come back here, we sign all the papers, and the job is yours. Well, I went with him to his home. On our way back, he takes his hand and he touched me on my thigh. And he said to me, on your days off, you'll be with me. I, I, something inside of me was, there was a pain that went from my mouth all the way down, honestly, to my stomach and seemed like I, it paralyzed me. It's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. All I could hear was what my grandmother said. I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? It was an impossible situation. Everly left the plantation to take control of her life. But here she was trapped. Again, she didn't have control. She racked her brain for a way to escape. I thought about jumping out of the car. I didn't know what to do. So I said nothing, absolutely nothing to him. He was parking the car. And so while he was, you know, before he got into the agency, I went and hid in the bathroom. I stood up on the toilet. And I mean, it seemed like hours and hours. And finally I hear them say, all the girls who didn't get selected, we're going to Hempstead. Get your things, we must go now. 
It's time to get on the bus. Well, I ran out. The man had left. And the lady said to me, oh, my goodness, we were looking for we, for you. We thought you had, you know, we thought you had gone. And I didn't say anything. I just got on the bus. This didn't seem like the new life she'd envisioned. But the only option was heading home to Cooley Me to face her family. And Everly felt she couldn't go back. The next morning, Everly went back to the agency and talked with a different family. But this time, not only did the husband come, the wife came too, and they chose me. I was one of the first ones that was chosen. It was the Bronsteins. And they told me that they had a little girl, three years old, who had a terminal illness. She had a, a kidney disease. And I said to them, I, 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 I can do this job because my younger sister has a liver disease uh, and it's terminal. And I got hired. They hired me right there. They took me to their home. It was a good match. Everly worked for the Bronsteins that entire summer. It was everything she could hope for. She was taking care of people. She had her own bedroom and her own bathroom for the first time in her life. She had saved all the money she made for school. When the summer ended, she went back to North Carolina to get ready for nursing school. She'd already sent in her application and just had a few tests to take on campus. One of the tests she had to take was an eye exam. It was a formality. Everly failed it. I mean, I just, I, I just so, I was so emotional. And, you know, I was crying. I said, but let me try again. Let, let me try again because I can, I, I can see. And they said, I'm sorry. You know, you failed the exam. You cannot, you cannot. You, you cannot get into school. Everly had been struggling with her vision for years, but in secret. She hadn't told anyone about it, not even her parents. The reason I didn't do anything, because I was ashamed. I didn't want anyone else to know. I was hiding it. I was in denial. I didn't want people laughing at me or making fun of me. Everly didn't know it at the time, but she had retinitis pigmentosa, or RP for short. RP is a genetic disease with no cure. It means that over the course of your life, you'll go partially or fully blind. Because of this, the one thing she had wanted since she was a child, to be a nurse, was now out of reach. So she made a new plan. She decided that she'd become a teacher. She figured a classroom would be well lit and her vision wouldn't be an issue. She went to college and after she graduated, she landed a job teaching high school in New Jersey. By 1970, Everly was actually living the life she dreamed about when she was 17. She was married, she had a kid, she had a place with plumbing and electricity, and she had a job that she loved. Most importantly, she wasn't on the Cooley Me plantation anymore, but, I mean, she'd still go back to visit her family on the holidays. And she'd swing by the big house and see the White Harstons as well. But each time she'd go back, it was a reminder of all the things she loved about her new life. But things didn't last and suddenly took a turn for the worse. Her marriage fell apart. She was forced to resign from her teaching job because of her vision. And several years later, she went completely blind. I think I went into a shell. I didn't talk about it to anyone. I didn't want to talk about it. I I didn't know how I was going to make it. I didn't know how I was going to survive. From an early age, Everly seemed to want nothing more than choices. She hated the plantation because it robbed her and her family of choices. And now that she had completely lost her vision, she wondered what kind of life she would live. Going back to Cooley Me would have been the easier path, but Everly would never take it. That's what had happened to my parents and my grandparents. They gave up, and I was determined to never give up. So Everly did what she'd become so good at over the years she found another way to resist the plantation's pull. She thought about other jobs she could have, other ways she could help people, and she found something. I figured you don't have to be able to see to sit and talk to people so I can get a job as a counselor. So I went back to college. How did I do it? I went to school at nights. I used cassette tapes because I couldn't see and recorded the lectures, and that's how I was able to go to college. 
and got a degree in counseling. She spent years counseling others on drug and alcohol abuse. It wasn't exactly her dream of being a nurse, but it played on Everly's biggest strength. You know what it was like? Fighting all the way. I used to ask myself or say, God, is this my mission in life to continue to advocate for self and others? Will I spend all of my life fighting for what's right? Everly now works as a president of the California chapter of the National Federation of the Blind. I had to fight all the way, but I never gave up. Fighting, resistance, takes many forms. Everly might have felt like her parents had just accepted life on Cooley Me, but the reality was her father had been plotting his escape as well. He'd been saving every extra penny. And more than 100 years after the Civil War ended, Everly's family moved off the plantation. My father um, purchased some land. And back then, I'm sure it was very cheap. And he decided he was going to build a house. And he moved my grandparents with him. He provided for them in, his, in their new home. My grandparents were no longer working in the plantation house, and neither were my Well, you know, we weren't sharecroppers anymore. It was beautiful. It was was freedom. It was a sense of dignity. For the first time ever, no Hairstons were serving any Harstons at Cooley Me. It was 1972. Shortly after Everly's family moved, scores of Hairstons started coming together for a family reunion. The very first one, it was in Lexington, North Carolina, at the YMCA. (laughs) (laughs) And they served barbecue sandwiches. There were Hairstons from all over. And Harstons. And Judge Peter was there. Just getting together as a family was, was great. That's right. Family. Some of the white Harstons, including Judge Peter, ended up being regulars at the reunions. Being a Hairston is a weird thing. Like, this last name, it was assigned by history, not necessarily by blood. And the Harstons, they're a part of that history and that family. And as far as any Hairston was concerned, the Harston family had been good to them. Their relationship wasn't what we usually think about when we think about master and slave, employee and employers. At least, that's what most of the Hairstons at the reunion believed. Until one day, 20 years later, Everly, who never stopped fighting, picked a new fight. And you could have heard a pin drop. It was like, I don't believe she did that. But I had said it. That's next time on The Nod. The Nod is produced by me, Eric Eddings, with Brittany Luce, Kate Parkinson Morgan, and Emmanuel Berry, with production assistance from Wallace Mack. Our senior producer is Sara Abdurrahman. We are edited by Annie Rose Strasser, with editing help this week from Alex Bloomberg, Catherine St. Louis, and Emily Ulbricht. Fact checking by Nicole Pasulka. Engineering from Cedric Wilson. Our theme music is by Khalid B. Additional music in the show from Tyler Strickland, Bobby Lord, Golden Graham, and Jupiter. Additional sound elements from Fenolia Productions. And hey guys, guess what? We've got merch now. So you can score your very own Nod t-shirt at Gimlet Media's Holiday Pop-Up Store. It's really nice. I'm not biased. It's true. It's just a fact at this point. Go to thenod.show slash shirt to buy your very own piece of the Nod. And be sure to come back next week for part two of this episode.
Thanks to our sponsor, Burrow. Burrow makes luxury couches for real life. Hurry and get your own unique Burrow couch today. And to get $50 off your order, use promo code DENIED at Burrow.com. That's B-U-R-R-O-W dot com, offer code DENIED. 